Hey everyone, it's Alexander, the real Mr. Robinson. So two weeks ago, I made my first trip out to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland, aka Batu. And I know I'm late on this, but I'm an annual pass holder and my pass was completely blacked out from the day Galaxy's Edge opened up until the day after Labor Day. So that was a whole summer of me not being able to go. But you know what, not too much of a deal. So there have been a lot of things said about Galaxy's Edge in the time that I wasn't able to go. I've heard lots of things that are really positive, really negative, or just downright stupid. But now that I've actually gone myself, I could give you my own impressions on what I thought of this place because it's a Star Wars land. As a Star Wars fan, even as somebody who loves what Disney's doing, well, outside of maybe Solo. I don't hate Solo. But anyway, as a Star Wars fan, you've always wanted to actually be in that galaxy far, far away. And when heading through the park and going straight to Galaxy's Edge, when I saw that opening, I was like, here we go, here we go. And the second I walked in, I felt completely immersed in this world. I don't think there's any theme park land out there that is as immersive as Galaxy's Edge. The attention to detail in this place is just absolutely stunning, and there's just so much going on in this place. Now, I know that there's only one ride currently open, Smuggler's Run, which I'll talk about in a bit, but in terms of just the land itself, there's so much to do that I don't think I even covered it all. I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I just missed. I'm not talking about Rise of the Resistance. I'm also not talking about the lightsaber workshop, which I unfortunately didn't get to do. But there's just so much here that I feel like you need to do at least more than one trip to really soak it all in. One of the really clever things about this land is the time period and the planet. Because when you look at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and you form the idea in your head of a Harry Potter land, the go-to answer of where it's supposed to be set is at Hogwarts, because it's Hogwarts. It's an iconic staple of the Harry Potter series. But with Star Wars, it's a vast galaxy of planets and different worlds and environments, so what do you do? And I think Disney made the right choice of making an original planet. But I know some people want to do Tatooine. I don't want to go to Tatooine because it's a crappy desert planet, and some people might want to do Bespin. I mean, okay, that's fine. I would be okay with Bespin, but there's just not a whole lot there for a theme park experience. What about Endor or Kashyyyk? That's, that could work also, but I know there's some people that might not want that either. What about Hoth? Nobody wants to go to Hoth, trust me. So by making this new planet Batu and giving the background that it's pretty much a trading outpost, there's a lot of room to bring in stuff that we're familiar with. And they also made this world to be in canon with what's going on currently. It takes place between The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker. And by having this land set in the sequel trilogy, you get all kinds of nods to other eras of Star Wars. In one of the stores, you get Grievous's mask, Clone Trooper Phase 1 armor, you even get the Mandalorian helmet from the upcoming show The Mandalorian. So there are a lot of Easter eggs to the past movies that you couldn't really do if this was set in another era. Like I said before, there is such a great level of detail to this world that even the merchandise is made to be within canon of the Star Wars universe. You have little dolls of Rey, Darth Vader, Kylo Ren, Watto, some other characters from the past movies, and they don't look like the Hasbro action figures or Barbie dolls that you'd see over at Star Tours, say. They look like primitive dolls. You even get that one Stormtrooper doll that we see in Rogue One that the Death Trooper picks up, and it's just an amazing level of detail. Nothing in Galaxy's Edge feels like it's out of place. It all feels very authentic. It feels like it belongs in Star Wars. And even when you're waiting in line for Smuggler's Run, you could see Big Thunder Mountain in the distance. But because the mountains share a similar color to Big Thunder Mountain, it just looks like it's part of Batu. And there's no other part of the Disneyland Resort that you can see from Galaxy's Edge. The only time that you can really be taken out of Galaxy's edge is whenever you see a Boeing 747 just flying off in the distance and you're like, well crap, there goes the illusion. Now let's get into Smuggler's Run first of all because it's the only ride that's currently open at the park. They're still working on Rise of the Resistance, which I'm excited for, but uh, yeah, Smuggler's Run. When I first went on it, I was totally underwhelmed. 
Yeah, I'm just gonna be straightforward with that right now. I should mention right now that I went by myself. I didn't go with a group, I didn't go with any friends or family. And I feel like if I went with a bunch of my friends, I wouldn't have felt as underwhelmed compared to going on the ride with a bunch of strangers who don't really know what they're doing. I mean, the ride is definitely an interesting concept. First of all, you get the pilot, the Millennium Falcon, which that's any Star Wars fan's dream. And second, it's the first motion simulator ride that's interactive. You know Buzz Lightyear's Astro Blasters or Men in Black Alien Attack, where they pretty much act like ride versions of video games? Well, Smuggler's Run is that as well. There is a predetermined film, so you're not really straying too far from what they've set up, because technology won't allow for that. But depending on how well you fly, fix the ship, or shoot down TIE Fighters, it accumulates your score, and sometimes it can lead to different endings as well. So that's pretty unique. Although personally, I like Star Tours a lot more because I do like being able to relive moments from the movies. Whereas this ride, while Every time I went on it, I started warming up to it. It definitely gives you a unique Star Wars experience. So I went on the ride three times and managed to do all three positions, pilot, gunner, and engineer. Pilot's probably my favorite because, I mean, you get to pilot the Millennium Falcon. And the moment I got the little card that said pilot, the first thing that went in my mind was, all those years of playing Rogue Squadron are finally gonna pay off. And I ended up being not that good, mainly because of my co-pilot, but you know what, that's, that's fine. It really takes a lot of hard work and perfect synchronization to pilot the Millennium Falcon with two people. Now in terms of the engineer position, I have heard horror stories about engineer, just how frustrating it is. I mean, Hello Greedo pointed out that he didn't like Smuggler's Run because he kept getting engineer and he just wanted to watch the ride rather than looking at the panels and just pushing the buttons to repair the Falcon. And to be honest, I was so quick with the buttons that I didn't mind the engineer position. I know a lot of people don't like it, but me, I don't mind it. Gunner position, however, is something that I never feel like I need to do again. Unless they actually put me within the gunner seat in the Falcon where it's supposed to be, then I don't care to be a gunner on Smuggler's Run again because all you're doing is just pushing a button constantly, almost like you're flipping a light switch and just shooting at TIE Fighters. You have the option to do manual or automatic. I went with automatic because I don't trust the people flying the Falcon since I don't know them, and I feel like their piloting is just gonna throw me off if I pick manual. So I just went automatic and took down a decent amount of TIE Fighters. So Smuggler's Run isn't one of the best rides Disneyland has to offer, but it's nowhere near one of the worst. I think it ultimately depends on who you go on the ride with and what position you get in terms of piloting the Falcon. So it could be a different experience each time. So as I mentioned before, I didn't do the lightsaber workshop, but I hope to do that next time I go, hopefully because I'll have enough money to get a lightsaber and do the experience. But I did try out the blue and green milk, which I'm just gonna use their accurate names. Bantha milk for the blue, and I want to say Thala Siren for the green milk. You know, the green milk that Luke Skywalker drinks in The Last Jedi that apparently everyone threw a fit over? What, you've never had milk straight from a cow's udder? Actually, I don't like milk at all, so... Ugh. And that actually leads to what I was really concerned about when getting these two drinks, because... I hate milk. I just don't like the way milk tastes. So I was really skeptical on these two drinks at Galaxy's Edge, and I gotta say... They were pretty good. They're actually more of slushy types, not pure liquid the way the butterbeer is at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. And in comparing the two drinks, I honestly couldn't tell the difference between either of them. Granted, I had each drink a couple hours apart because I didn't want to get them both back to back and then decide to leave Galaxy's Edge and go on, say, Space Mountain or Mission Breakout and then just puke constantly. But they're pretty good. And yeah, I can definitely see myself getting these drinks again when I go back, whenever that is. Speaking of drinks, I also got the opportunity to visit Oga's Cantina, where you got DJ Rex just being a DJ in the cantina after he crashed his star speeder on Batu. I don't drink a whole lot. I only drink when I'm with other people, but even then, it's rare. And I mainly wanted to go in just to get the full experience. And the drink I ended up getting was called Jabba Juice, which I joked with one of the employees of, this isn't juice that comes from Jabba, is it? And he was just like, no, no, not at all. And pretty much the drink was just 
orange juice with boba in it. And the atmosphere in Oga's Cantina wasn't as bad as I'd heard it was. It's actually pretty decent, although again, much like with Smuggler's Run, I feel like this experience would have been a lot better with other people. The last thing I want to talk about are the people working at Galaxy's Edge because they do not break character at all. I mean, I've heard a few Disney cast members break character here and there, and they turn to full-fledged Disney employees rather than residents on Batu, which I get it because as somebody who worked at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, there is a point where you kind of have to break character and really help guests, especially if they're in some critical situations. But for the most part, they did a very good job. Hello on Batu is Rising Suns and Goodbye is Till the Spire. I even told one employee, may the force be with you. She gave me this look like she didn't quite understand it. And then she just smiled and said, Till the Spire. So whoever you are, props to you for not breaking character. Now, in terms of the cast members who are playing characters within the land, we have Chewbacca, we have Rey, we have two First Order Stormtroopers, we have Kylo Ren, we have an occasional First Order officer around the area. And then we have a brand new character, V. Moradi, who pretty much goes around the entire land, sneaking around if stormtroopers are in the area, and occasionally walks up to guests, asking them to help her in the resistance. And if there's anything that gives Galaxy's Edge an edge over the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, it's these characters. Because the actors playing them do such a good job of interacting with guests. And one of the coolest things that I got to witness, and something that I just really dug, was there was one cast member accompanying Chewbacca, because you always need to have these cast members accompanying characters, and it's just the two of them over at the Rise of the Resistance entrance, taking a look at a T-70 X-Wing and act like they're repairing it. And I just watched that whole thing and went, wow, they actually had the freedom to go up to the X-Wing and just pretty much play around with it and act like they're repairing the ship. And then when Chewbacca came down, he walked past a bunch of people. He walked past me and then just patted me on the shoulder. And you know, as a Star Wars fan, that's just awesome. And there was one other moment when Chewie and the other cast member were fixing a satellite. One guest member was saying, hey, Chewie, Chewie. And as Chewbacca is just repairing the satellite, he does this. Like he doesn't look at the guest, but he just puts his hand up and says, hold on a second. And Again, that was really cool. So on the whole, as a first impression, I dug Galaxy's Edge a lot. I spent most of my day within that land because there was just so much to do, so much to see. And I just know that there is so much more I have to see. I still need to do the lightsaber workshop. I cannot wait for Rise of the Resistance at all. And I am I just love this land. I think it's very impressive and probably the most detailed and immersive, as I said, land that Disneyland has ever made. And those are my first impressions on Galaxy's Edge. I know I'm technically late, but you know, blacked out Disney Pass, so what can you do? But now I wanna know what you guys think about Galaxy's Edge. If you've been there, what are your impressions on everything in the park so far? And are you excited to go back once Rise of the Resistance opens? And if you've been to both parks, which one's better and what are the key differences, if any? Whatever the case may be, let me know in the comments below. And until next time, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, give this video a like, and of course, leave a comment. Don't forget to support my Patreon page, follow me on social media, and until next time, this is the real Mr. Robinson telling you there is only one until the spire.